Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Chapter 7 You Should Know the Difference Epistemology Scientific Knowledge What is logically wrong with the following statement? Science is the only way to know what is true. The statement expresses what is sometimes known as scientism and it is a very common belief in society today. Many people hold this opinion without realizing it. You may have even heard people say something like, well, it hasn't been proven scientifically, so we don't really know if it's true. But there is a major problem with this belief. The domain of science is the physical universe, and statements about that universe, which can be tested. If you were to draw a circle that represented what science knows and can know, Only ideas that can be tested by physical experiments would fit into that circle. However, the statement, science is the only way to know what is true, cannot be tested by any experiment. As a matter of fact, the statement is a philosophical statement about science, and it does not belong in the circle of science. But the statement denies anything outside of science as being knowable. Philosophy is not a category of valid knowledge. Therefore, the statement is self-refuting. It is a philosophical statement, but it states that philosophical statements cannot be known. Scientism is self-refuting. Epistemology How can we know things, then? The study of how we know things is known as epistemology. We have already followed Descartes' line of thought regarding what we can know with absolute certainty, and we found that we can know that we are thinking and that we exist. But that was the end. Nothing else is guaranteed, and everything can be doubted if we are really creative about finding other possibilities. Is that kind of radical doubt really the best way to go about trying to know? No, it is not, because it leaves us wrapped up only in our own minds. This type of knowing, where philosophers begin in the mind and try to work their way out, is known as idealism, and it has led to all kinds of problems in modern philosophy. Plato's theory of knowing is called anamnesis, and it comes from the Greek prefix ana, which means again, and the root nasis, which means memory. Anamnesis means remembering. Plato believed that a man is a soul that lives in the body for a little while. The soul, before entering the body, comes from the world of forms and knows all the true essences of things. When the soul enters the body, it forgets those essences, and the rest of life is spent recognizing and relearning those essences from the things around us, which are only copies of the true essences. For example, before entering the body, the soul sees and knows the essence of trees. The soul knows tree-ness. Then when the soul enters the body and encounters all of the copies and shadows of trees, remember the cave, the soul is reminded of the essence of tree, which it knew before. The evidence that Plato cited for this theory was the fact that a boy could come to learn new things only by asking him questions. See the Mino. By putting thoughts together, even an unlearned slave boy could put together a proof in geometry. The slave boy is able to do this, said Plato, because he already knew these things before inhabiting a body and only needed to be prompted to remember them. There are two things to notice about Plato's theory. First of all, his whole theory depends on the pre-existence and separateness of the soul. If the soul begins to exist with the body and is united to the body in an essential way, then there is no before when the soul could have known everything. Deductive versus inductive reasoning. Also, Plato is using the power of logic to develop new ideas. There are two ways of using logic. One is deductive reasoning, which is the type of reasoning we looked at in the chapter on logic. We begin with some premises, put them together, and the conclusion must be true as long as the premises are true. Plato's example of the slave boy producing a proof in geometry only demonstrates the power of this unique human ability to reason abstractly. The other type of reasoning is inductive reasoning, where we see a pattern, identify the pattern, and make predictions based on that pattern. Most of science is like this, and it never produces complete certainty. There is always the possibility that the next one will be different. Back to epistemology. Aristotle's theory of knowledge makes the most sense. Due to man's body-soul unity, we do not begin our lives knowing anything at all, but we are born with innate abilities. 
As we interact with the world, real objects impress themselves on our senses, and an image is formed in the intellect of those objects. Our intellect is then able to abstract the essences of those things and their properties. For example, when I see a table, my senses perceive the table. My abstract intellect then takes the sense impressions and abstracts those characteristics to form the idea of a table. As I see more tables, this idea is refined. Our mind, then, is able to recognize those same essences in other things and analyze those abstract concepts derived from our experience with the world. As we discover new things, our minds are able to think about how those new things are different from the other things we know. When I see a tree, I know that it is not a table because it doesn't fit with my idea of table. And as we discover different things in the same class, like learning that there are different types of tables, our mind is able to tell us how these are the same and yet different from each other. Lab tables, dinner tables, coffee tables are all tables, but they are not the same type of table. Telling the difference between things is an important part of learning and knowing. This theory of knowledge fits perfectly with the body-soul unity of man and the fact that we interact with real objects, and so the name of this theory is realism. Unreliability of the Senses Some people claim that our senses and sense impressions are not really reliable because we make mistakes so often. This is a self-refuting statement, though, because if our mistakes run so rampant, how can we know that anyone is wrong in the first place? Stating that someone made a mistake assumes that someone else knows the right answer. The fact that students get so many math questions wrong does not undermine the reliability of the rules of arithmetic. One of my philosophy professors once told our class about a special he saw on TV about how unreliable the human memory is. I wondered how he could be so certain about his memory of that TV program. The fact that we are sometimes wrong only emphasizes the need to check our conclusions and bring in the help of other people. Man is a social animal, and philosophy is a social endeavor. Language This whole process is aided greatly by language because it is by these symbols and signs of words that we are able to identify and communicate with each other and think clearly. This is why definitions are so important. Your thoughts and your communication can only be as clear as your definitions. Fuzzy definitions will result in fuzzy thoughts and fuzzy communication. The best way to avoid the common fallacy of equivocation is simply to ask for a definition. Our definitions tell us exactly how things are the same and different from each other. For example, Aristotle's definition of man as a rational animal tells us what class man fits into, animal, and the specific quality that makes him different from everything else in that category, rational. New words can be invented as we encounter new things, but language is first learned in a community. This emphasizes, again, the social nature of man. Everything ties together. Knowing by authority. Consider this question that I posed to my students at the beginning of my physics course. How do you know that the earth goes around the sun? I get a lot of answers about the sun going around the earth, the seasons, the changing positions of the stars in the sky, cloud movement, and all kinds of other ideas, but all of them can be explained in other ways. In the end, they realize that they themselves have no actual evidence that the earth goes around the sun and that they have only trusted their teachers. As a matter of fact, it is quite difficult to gain the experience necessary to prove that the earth goes around the sun, based on your own observations. For 99.9% of the earth's population, the movement of our planet is a matter of faith. We believe what the scientific community tells us. This is not a problem. The scientific community is trustworthy for this type of information but it is a little shocking to start thinking about how little we actually know for ourselves because of our own reason and experience. Therefore, another valid method of learning is through authority. The scientific community is a valid authority on questions about the orbit and motion of the planets, so we can trust it. It is necessary to trust groups and people in order to operate in the world. This too derives from our nature as social creatures. We are made to reveal truth to each other. Reason and experience points us to the validity of authority. I should point out that appealing to authority can also be a logical fallacy if the source is not a reliable authority. 
For example, many scientists do not hesitate to air their views on religion and philosophy. So some people appeal to these brilliant scientists when denouncing religion or belief in God. But these scientists are not necessarily authorities on philosophy, religion, or the Catholic faith. They may be brilliant scientists, and they would be reliable authorities on scientific questions, but that does not mean that they have achieved true wisdom. Experts are not necessarily wise men. This is why it is so important to be engaged in reading great books. We are social beings, and philosophy is best done in a community of philosophers. We obviously cannot talk with Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, and St. Thomas Aquinas in person, but we can talk with them through their books. We do not need to invent everything for ourselves. We can check our reasoning with theirs. The image of a dwarf standing on the shoulders of giants was a common image in the Middle Ages. We only are dwarves, and so we cannot see very far by ourselves. But if we climb onto the shoulders of giants, then we might be able to see a little further than they. When we read the books of the great thinkers of the past, we use their stature to prop up our own. An apprentice first has to learn the technique of the master, and then he can create his own style and go off on his own. We are fools and lovers of wisdom, so we gather together with others who share their love of wisdom even if it is only in books. We now have three methods of knowing, experience, logic, and authority. Those three resources must be used to know and learn truth. Whenever we must discover some truth, we gain as much evidence as we can and follow where it leads. We have nothing to lose but illusion and only truth to gain. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.